I think we start. Welcome, everybody. Just a few words to me. I'm Eva. I'm your host. I'm a science journalist, and I'm writing for many years about future technologies and how they are changing our lives. Um, I'm quite sure that blockchain technology somehow will change our lives as well. But there are many open questions until now. Some compare it with the early days of the internet, where you had to dial up with this strange noise onto the internet and were happy when you received at least one email. So this is early times as well at blockchain technology. And we are going to discuss some of these, these open questions and trying to look into the future, what is going to come. So his, this is the application session. So we have three talks about very interesting and promising applications for black blockchain technology. We do it like this, that everybody talks about 25 minutes and we have five minutes for a short Q&A, it's more for understanding, not for discussing the whole thing, because discussing we are going to do later on when we have the panel discuss discussion with all the whole audience and all the speakers together. So I hand over to Demelza Heis now. He's re she's researching at the University of Liechtenstein about the role of cryptocurrency in asset management. Is going to tell us about that. Welcome, Demelza. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, so basically, I have a background in economics. So it's, this is going to be a little bit more of the theory that you heard earlier applied to economics and finance. So basically, at the University of Liechtenstein, I've been teaching a course on Bitcoin and blockchain for the past two years. And we discuss many topics in that field, um, specifically related to economics. But one problem with uh, theory and academia and teaching economics specifically is that you basically study money your whole career, but you never seem to have very much of it. So uh, a, a couple years ago, uh, a wealth management firm in Liechtenstein said, well, we'd like to create a cryptocurrency fund, and would you like to join the team? And I said, sure, of course, that sounds great. I can finally apply all of this theory into practice. So I have basically one foot in academia and one foot in the industry, and my papers and my research is a combination of those two roles. And also, I just wanted to thank uh, the Heidelberg Laureate meeting for having me here. I think it was really great to see uh, uh, Whitfield Diffie here. I teach about him, and I think without his work, I probably wouldn't be giving this presentation now. So I definitely want to thank Heidelberg for having me here. Okay, so this uh, presentation today is going to basically start with an overview of financial aspects of cryptocurrencies. I'm not going to talk about the ethics or the technology. I'm just going to jump in with some assumptions on those topics, and then I'm going to discuss basically uh, what strategies people have been using and how those strategies have fared for people as far as their returns go and their risk. Then I'm going to follow up with further research areas for people that are in mathematics or in economics and are interested in researching cryptocurrencies. And I always have to say this at every single presentation, but this is not investment advice. <laughs> okay, so I basically that's the disclaimer here. So don't leave this presentation and sp spend all of your life savings on cryptocurrencies. I mean, if you want to, but not, it's not my fault. <laughs> okay, so basically people have been investing in cryptocurrencies since 2009. Um, invest investors and hedge funds hedge fund managers have also been using algorithms such as mean reversion and other trading strategies to trade cryptocurrencies since 2011. And a lot of people don't realize this, but it's not only hedge funds that are investing in cryptocurrencies. So today, institutional investors and pensions can actually invest in cryptocurrencies as well in Europe because there are regulated funds um, under the USITS and AIF uh, MD regulation. So basically there's a fund in Germany and there's a few funds in Liechtenstein and a few funds in Switzerland that allow large investors to invest in cryptocurrencies directly. Okay, and these funds legally, they require a custodian bank. So basically this is a bank, um, take for example, uh, uh, any large European bank. And this bank is licensed to actually store cryptocurrencies for investors. So this does not exist in the U.S. Currently, the U.S. does not have any licensed custodian bank or prime broker dealer. 
but Europe actually has several licensed banks that can actually hold cryptocurrencies for investors. And this is very important because the custodian bank is financially and legally obligated to store those cryptocurrencies. So if the custodian bank loses your cryptocurrencies, they're actually financially liable. Okay, and this is really unique about Europe, and this is why Europe is attracting so much capital and so many blockchain entrepreneurs currently. Now, these custodian banks, of course, will only take on this level of risk when they can find an insurance company that will insure their holdings. So the second part of custodian banks is insurance companies. And currently, Switzerland has an insurance company that is insuring custodian bank holdings of cryptocurrencies. But this is still a relatively new field, and there's a lot of space for competition. The third part is auditors. So for example, Ernst & Young is now beginning to audit cryptocurrency holdings held by regulated banks. Okay, so, but auditors need to basically be there to verify that the bank's claim is honest. So if they claim they have 1,000 Bitcoin, they actually, Ernst & Young will come in and check that those 1,000 Bitcoin exist, then they report it to the insurance company, and it basically works like traditional finance. Strange, my, fonts, my font package does not work on this laptop, so I have a very cute, curly handwriting <laughs> font here, um, which you can't really quite read very well. But in general, uh, this chart basically, this is just an overview, okay? So basically the idea here is that there's over 2,000 cryptocurrencies. So just to get an, a broad uh, understanding of the audience, how many people in the audience actually hold cryptocurrencies currently? Okay, okay, so that's, that's, that's quite a few of you, okay, wonderful. So this might be a little bit uh, repetitive for some of you and a little bit new for some of you. So basically there's over 2,000 cryptocurrencies that already exist. The total market value of all of the cryptocurrencies is already over 220 billion. It almost eclipsed 1 trillion in early 2018. And this is just a few of the coins that are above a billion dollars in market cap. And I've defined market cap um, here for anybody that's not really um, familiar with finance, finance jargon. Okay, so basically there's already many coins that are above a billion dollars. So this is already very relevant for investors. But just to put this into context, if you think about cryptocurrencies as an asset class, which this, uh, uh, whether an asset is an represents a unique asset class or not is very subjective and it's not exactly a science, but in general if you did think about it like this, you could see how small it is compared to all of the other assets that investors normally invest in. So here we have derivatives, and these are all proportionate, proportionate little bubbles here. So this is derivatives making up the largest financial market in the world. Then we have real estate, global real estate, 220 trillion. We have global bonds, global money, this is all of the uh, M1s of all the fiat currencies. This is stocks. Gold, of course, is just a little drop in the bucket. And then crypto is very small at the moment. So it still has quite, quite a way to grow if it's going to become relevant for institutional investors. Okay, so again, my fonts look very funny here, but this is um, the 90-day uh, correlation, moving correlation between the S&P 500 and the price of Bitcoin. So basically there's no trend. This is basically just showing that when the stock market goes up, it doesn't mean that Bitcoin goes up. And when the stock market goes down, it doesn't mean that Bitcoin goes down. Okay, so basically there's no clear relationship between stocks and bonds. And this is interesting from a financial perspective, I mean, sorry, no, no clear relationship between stocks and cryptocurrencies. And this is interesting for investors because when you see this kind of relationship, this means that you could actually pot potentially diversify away some of the risk in your stock market holdings. Because now you're gonna add an asset to your portfolio that performs in a different way, okay? And here you can see just some, some descriptive statistics. It's not correlated with any other asset class either. So um, NASDAQ, bonds, gold, real estate, okay? So it's basically uncorrelated with all other major asset classes, and this is a, a major reason investors are becoming interested in cryptocurrencies. Okay, this is another broad um, overview of financial topics with cryptocurrencies. This is basically just a simulation. If you had added Bitcoin to your portfolio, what would have happened to your portfolio? So a major um, measurement of, of portfolio return 
is the sharp ratio. So the sharp ratio is kind of a ratio of your risk to your return. Because just gaining return isn't relevant for all investors. A lot of investors actually want to minimize their exposure to volatility on the market. Okay, so basically, these numbers are, will be available for anyone afterwards that wants to further research this. But in general, your sharp ratio dramatically improves when you add just a little bit of cryptocurrency. And that's simply because the returns have been historically um, so significant and the, uh, the low correlation between cryptocurrencies and other assets. Okay, so this is a nice chart that I made uh, recently. This is all of the the bear markets that Bitcoin has had since its existence. So basically there's been about eight bear markets. A bear market is defined when uh, the, the price drops and continues to drop from its high. So basically it turns around, it's no longer in a bull market, it's actually on the decline. And year to date, so January of this year, we're, we're at minus 51% for Bitcoin. So maybe everybody's familiar with this, who invested, who raised their hands. They've probably, um, they're probably fully aware that, that cryptocurrencies are, have lost half of their value since the beginning of the year. Since 2013, they're still plus 4,000%. So it's, 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 still, it's still relatively um, performed very well <laughs> compared to other asset classes. So here's some, some different uh, durations of bull markets. I, unfortunately, invested in the longest bull, uh, uh, bear market, excuse me, that existed, this one. It lasted for two years. It lost 84% of its value during that bear market. And least to say, I had about two years of sleepless nights and probably added a decade uh, of age to my life um, during those two years because I didn't really realize what I was investing in. And, and how risky it was as an asset class. And that's also what uh, motivated me to, to continue to do this research. Okay, so that's an overview of the financial topics, the financial uh, market on cryptocurrencies. Now I'm going to talk about a paper that I'm writing for uh, the University of Liechtenstein and uh, for my research. Okay, so in this paper, I'm basically going to talk about what investment universes are. I'm going to define risk with cryptocurrencies. And then I show how I collect data, and then I basically calculate different performance measures on that data. And uh, basically, the point of this um, paper is basically just to ask the question, if I do invest, what is the optimal investment strategy? Okay, so if, I, if I'm going to put some money in this uh, as a diversifier for my portfolio, how should I go about putting all of my money in? Should I put it all in Bitcoin? Should I put it in a handful of tokens? Should I put it in... Um, Silvio's Algorand, you know, how should I go about doing this? Okay, and there's a few things of practical consideration that are important to consider. First of all, liquidity constraints. Okay, so many cryptocurrencies have daily trading volumes that are so low, which means the amount of people actually investing in that coin is so low that it actually doesn't have the capacity to hold large investments. So if you put a large investment into that cryptocurrency, you're actually going to move the price with your own transaction, and you're going to actually make the market fluctuate. Um, so basically, you want to have no coins in your portfolio that have shallow order books or have single point of failure order books. So here's what a single point of failure order book is. This is where your coin is only traded on one exchange that's domiciled in a specific country. And then that country decides to ban all cryptocurrencies and then your money is stuck on an exchange and you can't get it out. Okay, so this is one constraint. Another constraint is insurance constraints. So um, coming from the fund side, we, in, in, our, in our fund, we actually cannot invest in any coins that do not have cold storage options. This, this is simply because an insurance company will not insure the bank's holdings if they cannot be relatively sure that they actually can securely store them. Okay, so this is another constraint. Legal constraints, okay, so basically privacy coins. We, can't we, we cannot invest in privacy coins because basically this is a gray area legally. So if you invest in Monero or Zcash or Dash, you may or may not be supporting illicit activity. So this is another constraint. And finally, the final constraint is rebalancing constraints, so transaction cost. So a transaction cost is basically every time you convert from Bitcoin to fiat or fiat to Bitcoin, you have to pay a fee. Okay, and if this fee is relatively high, 
then you don't want to convert back and forth too often, right? So basically, uh, one thing is that you have to consider how often you're going to be rebalancing your portfolio. Is it going to be every quarter you change what you hold, every month you change what you hold, every week, every day, et cetera? Okay, so in this paper, I basically liken two things together, cryptocurrencies and the stock market. And I do this because everybody knows the stock market well, and we can easily just say, does traditional financial theory apply to cryptocurrencies? So we can basically just um, consider these as two very similar markets. And in fact, the regulators consider these things as two very similar markets. So the SEC in the US uh, recently announced that all initial coin offerings are security offerings, in their opinion. Okay, um, which basically is, if, if, if anyone's not familiar with an initial coin offering, what that is, is that's basically when a group of entrepreneurs comes together and says, we have an idea, we want to raise capital, and what we're going to do is we're going to create a Ethereum ERC-20 token or a similar cryptocurrency. We're going to issue this to our investors, and in exchange, our investors are going to give us fiat currency or another cryptocurrency. And we're going to give them a token, and that's going to represent some kind of security as an investment in the entrepreneur's ideas, okay? Um, and the SEC basically said this, 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 these are securities, okay? And FINMA in Switzerland uh, re also said recently the same thing. They said that about 95% of all ICOs are security offerings. And so the regulators think of it that way, but so do entrepreneurs, because you can see here that entrepreneurs are actually increasingly using initial coin offerings to raise capital. So in quarter two of 2018, just the previous quarter, the ICO market accounted for 45% of the traditional IPO market and 31% of venture capital market. Okay, so basically entrepreneurs and regulators are seeing this as just a new technology, a new way to raise capital. Okay, and also on the stock market, there's various strategies that you can use to invest in stocks. Stock picking, for example, you can say, I think Visa is undervalued or I think it's overvalued. Therefore, I'm going to invest or sell, uh, buy or sell Visa stock. This is called an active trading strategy because you're actively uh, making an investment decision. There's also passive investment strategies. For example, market cap weighted, liquidity weighted, mean, vari mean variance optimization, and one over N. Okay, so basically, I think the one that's the most interesting here is the one over N strategy, because this strategy does not rely on any data and any theory, and it's basically as old as mankind. So basically, the idea here is that diversification is good, and this is an age-old wisdom. So basically, one over N is just, let's say you have N assets in your investment universe, so you have... Um, you know, you go, to the, you go to the dog races or the horse races, and there's 10 horses there, and basically you can't figure out which horse is going to win. And then what you do is you basically just put an equal amount of a bet on all of the horses in the race. So you know you're going to win. Um, you might not win very much, but you know you're going to win because you've invested in all of the horses at the race. Okay, so this doesn't rely on any data or any theory. And um, just for definitions, market cap weighted is basically where you take the market capitalization of the coin. So we saw with Bitcoin it was around, I think, 220 billion, uh, no, sorry, sorry, excuse me, what, what was, what, sorry, no, what was um, Bitcoin at now? Yeah, around, okay, on this slide it's saying um, 200, above 200. Okay, so like, let's say that you take Bitcoin and um, what you do is you basically invest according to the market capitalization. So if Bitcoin has if Bitcoin makes up 80% of the market, then 80% of your portfolio is invested in Bitcoin. Okay, and then if Ethereum makes up 20% of the market, you invest 20% of your portfolio in Ethereum. So this basically, this is market cap weighted. Liquidity weighted is basically uh, daily trading volume. So the coins that have the highest daily trading volume are the coins that make up the largest weights in your portfolio, et cetera. Mean variance optimization, min variance optimization. This is basically an optimization problem. And um, I won't go into this too much, but there's another paper uh, recently written by Brown and Mestel that do this for cryptocurrencies, and they also have some really interesting results 
on mean variance portfolios for cryptocurrencies. Okay, second part is defining the investment universe. So basically, it's, again, it's just like opening up a textbook on the stock market. All you have to do is just read the textbook on the stock market and you know exactly where the cryptocurrency market is going. So we can break it up into different groups. We have blue chip stocks like IBM and Apple, and then we have blue chip cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum. We have emerging market stocks from different countries in Asia and South America, and then we have emerging market cryptocurrencies that are from South, Amer South America and Asia. Finally, we have penny stocks, and we have penny coins. Penny coins is not the term that's normally used for this group. The term that's normally used for this group, maybe some of you know, it starts with S, it ends with T, it's four letters. <laughs> okay, so this, this is normally, you know, that we also, it's the same, it's the same. You have, you have broad categories and you have coins that fit into these. And right now I'm in the cur currently in the process of just looking at the descriptive statistics of these different groups to see for patterns. But it's definitely clear that in the literature on, finance, on f traditional finance, you can see that penny stocks have a negative return. So in general, when you're investing, the likelihood that you get a positive outcome is, is statistically uh, proven to not exist. So uh, um, it, it doesn't exist statistically. But um, it's, and it could potentially be the same with penny coins because there's so many different things going on here. Um, for example, the car taxi ICO. Is anybody familiar with the car taxi ICO? Hope nobody here invo is involved with that project. Um, so recently, the Securities Exchange Commission in the US a, um, created this blockchain explorer, which allows the regulators to see where each transaction is moving throughout the blockchain. Because they're not exactly fully anonymous, right? They're pseudonymous, unless you have a privacy coin like Monero or, or something like that. But with car taxi, what the regulators could do is they could trace back all of the transactions to the original wallets. And what they found is that car taxi claimed something like they had raised $7 million. But what they actually found out is that they had only actually raised $2 million, and then the creators of the ICO had cleverly taken the $2 million and then put it through a whole system of new wallets and then reinvested it back in their own wallet to make it look like they had raised much more so that they could get more media hype and so that they could get more investors because then other people would think, oh wow, that coin must be very popular, maybe I should invest in it, right? So um, there's definitely a lot of weird market manipulation going on in these penny coins. Okay, then defining risk, the next step. Okay, so a lot of the papers on cryptocurrency so far that have come out in peer-reviewed journals basically use um, variance as a measure of risk. And uh, they also use sharp the sharp ratio as a performance measure. However, um, there's already literature from uh, traditional finance that says that variance may not be the best measure of stock market performance because it does not consider the third and fourth moments of the distribution. Okay, so basically you can see here that these two distributions you could say of returns or of any um, outcome, these two distributions have the same first and second moments of the distribution, right? The first mean and uh, the mean and the variance are the same. But actually, uh, stock market returns do not follow a normal distribution and neither do cryptocurrency market returns. So most likely there's actually a better measure for risk and a better measure for performance than either the variance or the Sharpe ratio. And that's basically what I argue for in my paper. Okay, so just for um, time uh, purposes and uh, also uh, to, to not complicate this too, too, too much, um, I'm happy to ask questions about it afterwards. But basically, um, stock, in order to use Sharp and in, in, in Variance, you would basically need to assume some kind of uh, normal, normally distributed returns. Um, but definitely, there are several papers that already confirm that Bitcoin, Dash, Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash, and Ethereum, and many other cryptocurrencies have a skewed and leptocurtic return distribution. So basically this is where you have, I think I showed in the next slide, this is where you have this uh, high peak and fat tails, right? Kind of like the Nassim Taleb 
uh, black swan distribution. So you have um, basically positive skew with cryptocurrencies, and you also have outliers that really uh, change the distribution from, from a normal one. So this is a normal distribution set around the same mean uh, for Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is this blue line, and the red line is a normal distribution. Okay, and yeah, I, I, there's also a paper that does this. It was in the Journal of Risk Finance um, last year, and they basically cover this for all the cryptocurrencies. And I've just done some very brief uh, analysis of, of different penny coins to see if there's a negative skew um, similar to the stock market. Okay, so the solution that I propose is the omega ratio. So it already exists. It's already being used in traditional finance. And uh, basically what this does is it incorporates all the information available in the distribution. So it incorporates the third and fourth moments, kurtosis and skewedness. And what I do is I collect data from CoinMarketCap. Basically, I take all of my cryptocurrencies. I take my strategies. I start with an initial investment amount. And then I see what happens to that initial investment amount. Okay. So... Out of all the strategies that I discussed previously, the one over N, the market cap weighted, active stock picking, volume weighted strategies, mean variance optimization, what strategies do you think performed best on the stock market? So if you had to go out on the stock market and invest today, what strategy would you use? Which one? Trend following, okay, trend following. Mean reversion, okay. One over N. Great, one over N. So historically, one over N outperforms all these other strategies. And there's a few reasons for that. Um, basically, trend following and fundamental analysis fit into the active trading strategy branch. And the passive trading, passive trading uh, strategy branch basically includes any strategy where you don't have to take daily decisions. Um, basically, you just invest on day one, you walk away, and you come back later on. Okay, and one over N is basically one of those passive trading strategies where you just sprinkle a little bit of coins around on all the different stocks, and then you see which ones grow and which ones don't make it. And definitely with the stock market, one over N performed the best. It's, it's very hard to beat. Um, there are some active trading strategies uh, that use mean reversion, and they actually do outperform benchmarks uh, by 1 over N. But it's, it's uh, again, going back to the bell curve of returns, it's most likely the case that these investors actually got lucky and had a return that was above the mean, just because statistically some investors will have returns that are above the mean. Right? But it's very statistically unlikely that two years in a row an investor can beat their benchmark. And by the third year, it's very statistically unlikely. So you don't have, you have they've done many papers on fu fund managers, right? So fund managers cannot consistently beat their benchmarks, unfortunately. Um, which is, it's very hard because I know this fact, and then at the same time in my job, I have to go and justify my fees to someone. So it's, 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 really, it's a really difficult uh, dilemma here. I, I struggle with cognitive dissonance uh, every day, but most of the time I just tell them the truth and then hope that they'll invest with me, but that doesn't usually work. They usually go for the, the you know, hot shot investor that'll tell them they can beat the, beat the market every year. Um, and then my question is, is it the same for cryptocurrencies? So basically, I ran, this, ran the test, and you find, some, so you find some interesting results with cryptocurrencies. Um, you know, what's weird is that, first of all, one over five, so if you just invested in the top five cryptocurrencies beginning in 2013, and then you rebalanced your portfolio every quarter, you actually performed better than if you had only invested in Bitcoin. Okay, so in the first phase, we see some benefits of diversification because actually this portfolio has a higher terminal value. If you had invested $1,000 in the top five coins, rebalanced every quarter, you actually would have earned more, including rebalancing transaction fees, than if you had just invested in Bitcoin. But then we see that as you add 10 to your portfolio, actually your terminal value starts to drop. And by the time you invested in the top 1,000 cryptocurrencies, your portfolio is really taking a hit. 
Okay, so this chart's a little bit hard to see here, but if you have any, if you'd like to see the paper afterwards, I'm happy to, to, to distribute it. But basically, what's weird here is that it looks like there's some limits to diversification within the cryptocurrency asset class. Okay, so basically that's what I try to show in my paper. Now my next paper, next series of papers, I'm going to try to be, I'm going to try to understand why this limit to diversification exists. And here's some possible reasons. Ambiguity aversion, which is in the literature on financial markets, this already exists. Basically this is the concept that you will only invest in a stock that has a very long history of data and so that there's no parameter uncertainty about your distribution of returns. So you're pretty much sure what your covariance matrix is going to look like. Um, legal constraints. So for example, at our fund, we can only invest in about 10 different coins legally. Okay, so it could be that, oh yeah, okay, so I'm running out of time here. Okay, skew and kurtosis, also penny coins, possibly they have a negative return, uh, statistically. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and finish up here. Conclusion. Um, stocks and cryptocurrencies are two different ways to raise capital for entrepreneurs. Some cryptocurrencies are extremely volatile, and um, this might suggest that there could be some benefits to diversification. However, it seems like there's limits to cryptocurrency diversification, and the sharp ratio may not, may not be an appropriate performance measure, and m variance neither, uh, because the higher moments of the distribution matter for cryptocurrency returns. Okay, um, and then finally, just for a plug for myself, I make a report. It's uh, sponsored by Fontabel Bank in Switzerland, and this a report is available for free in German and in English uh, every quarter, and we basically, this is just financial analysis of the cryptocurrency market uh, for investors. So I hope to, um, yeah, take some questions. Thank you so much, Demelsa. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> so, time is short. One question. Who is the first? That's you. Uh, ah, there's, there's someone with the micro coming. Uh, yeah, my, my question is uh, really simple. So I think it's really nice uh, to introduce higher moments, but if we have a uh, few points and really like uh, I tell, I guess it's really noisy to measure the third order or the fourth order momentum. And I'm just wondering if we could measure something else, like for example, just the L1 norm or, or other stuff like this to have higher information. What you said suggest measuring what instead? The L1 norm, the, or just L norm? Or? Yeah, potentially. Um, definitely a big major limitation would be the lack of data available. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's definitely one problem with this whole market as a whole. It's, the results are definitely certainly noisy, and I do weekly observations here, so it would be very hard. Potentially, that could be a way to overcome that, that problem, though, certainly. So sorry for all the other questions, but I promise we have more time later on at the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. See you later at the panel. Thanks. Now I would like to welcome Dexter Hadley. He's from the University of California. He has a medical background, and he is talking about distributing cancer imaging for artificial intelligence. And that's what I think an interesting use case for blockchain technology. Welcome, Dexter. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to thank Ava personally for inviting me to the um, conference and all of you for showing up. So yeah, I'm a physician, I guess, by training. but. I like to say I spent 10 years in medical school figuring out how to not practice medicine. And this is what I've been doing in the meantime. <laughs> um, so I'm a faculty member at the University of California, which is um, one of the only state health systems left in America, like state run. There's six medical schools uh, at UCSF, which is the San Francisco, which is the flagship. There's something like four million patients at our university, probably more if you consider the whole state. And uh, obviously I'm talking about cancer imaging. This is all of the cancer imaging that has been done at UCSF in the last uh, two decades. Um, about 5,000 exams have been run on patients. Um, and you can see um, chest x-ray, CT, MNG's mammogram. That's what I'm going to focus on, the yellow. 
uh, but you can sort of see it's a long distribution, and this is a cumulative distribution. Uh, so if you look at mammograms, um, there's been about, this is current to 2016, but if you add 2017 in, there's about a million mammograms that we have in our system that doctors can look up. But can anybody guess, mammograms have been since the 80s. Anybody have any idea what happened before 2005, 2006? Why the distribution is flat? Because they threw them away. So film, right? So we transitioned from an era of film mammography to digital mammography. HIPAA, the statute of limitations is seven years for criminal liability. So after seven years, millions of dollars to store the film. They didn't think it was worth it. Um, I beg to differ. But this is, you know, remember, you can't really see on this graph, but um, around 1985, there should be, right here, there should be a, a shaded region of the graph, which shows when the FDA regulated mammography in America. Uh, mammography is a $10 billion industry, at least in America. And what this graph shows is it really doesn't work. Right? So this is the average size of tumor excised at surgery. Right? So if when the FDA implemented mammography standardization in the 80s, you'd expect um, big tumors to go down because you're catching small tumors earlier. What you see is small tumors going up, meaning you're taking out clinically irrelevant, you know, you're identifying and surgically extracting from patients clinically relevant cancer because the rate of large tumors is about the same. Right? So this is, and there's many different papers that show this. This is in the New England, very prestigious one. Um, and by and large, you know, manual breast exam in the bathroom works as well, if not better, than mammograms. Um, and this is why. So a first-year radiology resident has to look at this, which is, t you know, two, two breasts, two views. So you have four images, and based on these four relatively low-resolution images, you're supposed to find precancer uh, or early cancer. And then this is an example where no radiologist is going to find cancer on this, but this is confirmed pathology confirmed cancer. So this is an example of radiologically opaque cancer. And just remember that buzzword, the jargon, radiologically opaque. Um, anyhow, so this full field diagnostic mammography, this is code for two-dimensional mammography. Uh, like I said, about a $10 billion business because 30 million mammograms, 30 to 40 million mammograms are run every year. FDA regulates every single one of them. Um, you know, the sensitivity and specificity is okay. It's not in the 90s. But every percentage point, you know, one in eight women in their lifetime is going to get breast cancer. So every percentage point, either direction, is hundreds of thousands of women, right? In America, at least, probably in Europe as well. But this is just incredible. 95% of women are going to have a false result over their lifetime. One in two women um, are going to get called back with added anxiety, added surgery, added mastectomy for no good reason. Um, and this is over their lifetime, so one in two women will have a false reading over their lifetime. Um, and 10% will have some kind of surgery because of it. So these are, these are bad numbers. Um, well, computers have been around for 20 years, and they really haven't worked because um, the way computer vision has worked before this era of deep learning was um, basically mimicking a human's knowledge. So humans can't do a good job of this, neither can computers if you just mimic. So I'm in a big data lab, an AI lab, and a, a deep learning. Many of you are in statistics. I hope you've heard about this. But this is um, supposedly revolutionizing just about every industry today, arguably except medicine. Um, so deep learning is different to, to traditional computer vision in the sense that the computers figure this out given label data. There's no rules. There's no textures. There's no colors. There's no shapes or shades or anything. Or, that go into this kind of analysis, but you know, a lot of computation. Uh, theoretically, this has been around since the 50s, or sort of the idea of artificial neural networks. Um, functionally, they're coming out today because we have GPU compute now, very large, highly par parallelized um, uh, hardware. And uh, guys like Jeff Dean, I met him yesterday, uh, have figured out tricks to make these very large um, computational problems tractable. Right, so today, um, and think about it like this, so most of statistics, maybe I shouldn't say that in this audience, but a lot of statistics is based on the equation of a line, right? Y equal mx plus c or b, depending on American or British background. Uh, which means, you know, there are two parameters in that equation, so with two points you can plot a line and then predict every y given an x. 
So the deep learning models that predict weather, for instance, there are more parameters in those models than there are atoms in our universe. And I know this audience likes to talk about universe, but there's no way you could deterministically predict um, these parameters, these very large parameter spaces. So uh, two points are not going to cut it. You need very big data, uh, which is the age we're living in today, especially in medicine. Um, and don't take my word for it, but um, you know, I learned in medical school. You know, do, anybody ha has any idea who this is? Marie Curie, uh, the mother of radiology, Nobel Prize winner in chemistry and physics, I believe, um, died of radiation poisoning. But the way our brain recognizes this as Marie Curie is, uh, you know, light hits the retina, the cells in your retina, uh, goes through a series of hierarchical uh, distinct networks that interpret uh, colors and shapes and this and that and the other uh, before the higher cortex recognizes this is a picture of an old lady or Marie Curie. Uh, well, Google and Microsoft and, and, and Facebook, they've built similar uh, computational equivalents, whereas uh, these convolutional neural networks are deep hierarchical networks. Um, every single layer is multiple neurons that are interconnected, uh, and each of those are parameters that need to be set by very large data sets for them to work accurately. But given large data sets, given big compute, uh, these things work better than humans. And don't take my word for it. Uh, so this is the ImageNet competition. There's um, a very large standardized data set that came out of uh, Princeton and after Stanford um, of, a th on average, a thousand objects into a thousand categories. So on average, a thousand categories per object. And these are just regular pictures of dogs and cats. I would imagine they scraped the social media and just took the tags to build this data set. But, um, and the competition is, you know, uh, every dot on this is a performance of an entrance entrant into this competition. You know, given a whole that set of, let's say, 1,200 images, predict the class of those 1,000 classes. The training set is 1,000 images of every class. Uh, and you can see before deep learning came on the scene where you're telling a computer to look for this color or this shape or this texture to figure out a dog from a cat, best accuracy we could achieve was 70, 75%. Uh, uh, Toronto, University of Toronto, Jeff Hinton's group, Alex Nutt, is the first deep learning approach to this competition and significantly outperformed everybody else. They stopped the competition this year because today humans have been beat for two or three years now, so they're at 98, 99 percent, uh, which means when you submit a low resolution, uh, you know, dark image of a cat to Google, Google has a better chance of guessing that's a cat than a human, right? Uh, so, so Today, in fields like regular computer vision, regular um, object recognition, and entity recognition, computers outperform humans. Uh, Google figured this out and paid 10 ophthalmologists to look at pictures like this, which is a fundoscopic exam of your eye, and make a prediction about some diabetic retinopathy. They did it 125,000 times. <laughs> right, and trained a model, so that, you know, for the statistician, this is an area under the receiver operating curve. Every dot is a human compared to the computer. Only this guy, here's a zoom in of the same curve. Only this guy outperformed the algorithm, right? So giving enough time and enough knowledge, we could learn his knowledge, his biases, and outperform him. Um, the next big thing in deep learning in medicine was the Stanford paper. <laughs> So it's very clever how they did this. Uh, so they, they claim that this network can predict uh, skin cancer better than a dermatologist. Uh, something like one in 30 biopsies for skin cancer are not cancer. Uh, this algorithm takes it down to one in 10. The funny story behind this is nobody has hundreds of thousands of biopsy confirmed melanoma or skin cancer, period, right? Taken with an iPhone or whatever. So what they did is they took, you know, maybe 20, 30, biopsy confirm images of moles, and then literally Photoshop them on different people's ethnicities and skin, and artificially created this data set. So they artificially showed in this kind of data set, deep learning works. Uh, this slide changes depending on, you know, what's the biggest thing going on right now, but I don't know if you noticed Apple's keynote last week or two weeks ago, whenever it was, but people wear EKGs on their hands now with the new Apple Watch. And deep learning is the one that tells you uh, interprets the tracing, right? So if you're in uh, AFib or atrial fibrillation or, uh, God forbid, a systole, <laughs> uh, deep learning algorithms are the ones that sort of give you uh, information on this raw data. So you probably figured it out by now, but, but my goal is to apply the same kind of machine learning that can outperform humans on dogs and cats to, you know, uh, ductal carcinoma in situ or uh, 
um, lobular carcinoma in situ, so on and so forth. Where am I going to get a million images <laughs> of that labeled, is the question. Uh, well, various people have tried. One, uh, this is data from the Dream Mammography Challenge. So they, they basically, uh, again, this is medical data. It's not dogs and cats you could put on the internet, right? So this is private data, and there are all kind of rules that sort of surround how this data can be used. And this competition was to use 600,000 odd images of cancer that have been labeled by pathology. Um, but because of the privacy restrictions on this very valuable data, they released 50 of these points, which is in two-dimensional, I think it's Tisney or, I don't know, some kind of principal comp component space. Blue is non-cancer, red is cancer. So we ran this 50 points through the original model, this model, right? The first AlexNet model, the one that won this competition. And already, you can see the red segregates from the blue. We didn't do not anything. This is, mod this is data trained on dogs and cats. This is, these are models trained on dogs and cats, and we could already see discrimination. And when you look a little bit closer as to how these things are clustering, you see what? You, you see, it's kind of hard from this angle, but uh, around every mole, when you go for a mammogram, they put a marker. It's hard to see, but there's mar mole markers here. So all of these dots have mole markers. That's why they're clustered together. There's plate artifacts. So the lead plate they put on you uh, is another reason that these things are misclassified. And uh, implants. So this is what implants look like on a mammogram and all of these points here are related because they're implants. So with a little bit of, with, with more data, we think we can uh, reduce this kind of artifact, right? Again, this model was trained on dogs and cats. But with more data, with more mole markers, with more plates, with more of everything, we can reduce that to really emphasize the cancer signal. So like I said, this competition, there were 600 and something thousand images. I already have more of this than, uh, than that competition. And here's the data we have in UCSF over the last 20 years. Uh, so we have 900,000 images sitting on a server somewhere. A mammogram is four images per exam, right? So that's the scale. Uh, so this is the raw images. They're called DICOM. That's just what they're called. Uh, and for every DICOM, if you divide this by four, there's, there's about this many radiology reports, right? So there's 166 odd thousand reports that correspond to these 900,000 images, because it's four to one, plus or minus. Uh, and a subset of those, so the you know, every image gets read by radiologists, and if it's suspicious, it goes to pathology. So a subset of these, three, 33,000 or so of those reports went to pathology, meaning it's suspicious for cancer, and a pathologist read it. Um, so these are the actual exams, and these are the number of patients. So on average, you know, 10,000 patients have 32,000 exams, so two or three per patient, right? So our job is how do we turn this stack of data that's completely unrelated? They're in different departments. Radiology is one department, uh, pathology is another department, and they don't talk to each other, <laughs> right? So how do we turn that into a label data set that we can use? Well, we use deep learning, and, and um, I'll show you what we did. So here's the, here's the problem. Where is the cancer diagnosis? It's in a report that looks like this. The patient, you know, there's a whole preamble here, but the, the cliff note, so to speak, is the impression. Here are the samples that were sent, A, B, C, D, and E. Two of them are breast, this one and that one. The rest of them are lymph nodes, and the cancer is in this one. All right, you can read it if you like. Who's going to sit there and read 30,000 of these things, right? Uh, so what we did is we read 3,000. We read 3,000, and then we trained a, 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 a different kind of... Uh, neural network, a LSTM network, um, to predict over the remaining 27 odd thousand reports, uh, whether it's the left breast that was positive, the right breast that was positive, or neither breast was positive, right? So those are the possible outcomes. Um, and we did pretty well, right? So we trained, we read, manually read 3,000 of these reports. We tried a bunch of different NLP predictors, um, and we found, we were able to publish our results in a peer-reviewed journal. I mean, here are the AUCs across the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different algorithms. You see, like, regular logistic regression does very well to predict left breast, right breast, cancer, not cancer. Uh, we published this. Um, not, not too important, uh, but if you want to learn more, you can go here. Last month that came out. But now we have a tool where all this routine data I just showed you we can set up an algorithm to label these imaging, right? So a woman shows up January 1st, bilateral screener, which is imaging. It's suspicious. She comes back in February for another set of diagnostic imaging. That's two views versus four. 
a little bit different magnification. Middle of, the, um, of February, she goes for the first biopsy because this has been suspicious. Um, that biopsy is a needle biopsy, a fine needle. Um, pathologist looks at this and says, well, this woman has cancer. Comes back two weeks later, she has a lumpectomy, which is indeed curative. Um, you know, so the fine needle, the pathologist thought it was DCIS, which is carcinoma in situ, so not full invasive cancer. But uh, by the time she came back for the lumpectomy, which is more tissue, more um, precision in a diagnosis, so to speak, they upgraded her to invasive ductal carcinoma. So she has full-blown frank cancer. The lumpectomy is curative because you could see later on in August, she's now negative for any pathology, right? So, you know, we can read these things off of the reports now. And given that we can read them, we can assign the imaging the worst possible uh, clinical label, right? So IDC, invasive ductal carcinoma, is worse than DCIS. So both of these imaging should be labeled IDC because it precedes the IDC that was confirmed. And this one is negative. Does that make sense? Now we have a very straightforward algorithm. So now we can take our you know, 900,000 images and put them in terms of who had cancer and who didn't. Pathology. Again, cancer is a pathology diagnosis. Um, so we have 36 odd thousand negative cases of images, 21 odd positive, thousand positive cases of pathology confirmed cancer, and 700 odd cases never went to pathology. They're all negative. Right? So this is pathology. And what's interesting, now we can have uh, a war of the specialties because radiologists also score these things based on what they think. This is this BIRAD score 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. 4, 5, and 6 is confirmed cancer. Zero is come back for another scan, basically. Maybe cancer, maybe not. One and two is not cancer. So you can see, just based on the numbers, the pathology more or less lines up with the radiology, at least the scoring. Um, so now we have a massive data set. How do we know it's right? Well, how do we even know that breast cancer screening doesn't work? Well, places like this, which is a national um, multi-million dollar funded multi-year study over the last 20 years, the Breast Cancer Surveillance Consortium um, has been literally calling up patients, getting their notes, reading the notes, and recording which mammogram was true positive, which mammogram was false positive, true negative, false negative, and calculating the statistics that tell us that breast cancer screening really has not worked as we thought it has. Right, so we, we, one of the biggest sites for this BCSC is in San Francisco. So we took 200 of our patients. Again, these people are called up. You know, this is a a very time-consuming process, 20 years to get this amount of data um, that the BCSC has. So we asked them, for these 200 patients from UCSF, what did you find? Are there true positive um, radiology findings, or negative, or false positive, or false negative? Uh, 15 cases, we disagreed with them because of semantics. So they're an epidemiolo epidemiological surveillance consortium. So they only call the first um, screening of cancer, the first positive is the only one they care about. They don't call subsequent ones positive. So we could fix that semantically. We missed two cases, very honest. We missed two cases because these patients went somewhere else for their pathology. So we never had the pathology to begin with. So the, we estimate somewhere about our precision and accuracy is around 95 point something percent, 99.5 percent. So we're very confident that, you know, we can recapitulate what took 20 years for this consortium to do in a few months with computers. And how do we know it works? Because given the labels to the imaging, we can learn breast cancer screening, right? So we took, this is a very simple data set. We're working on much bigger ones, but um, this is training a model to predict whether a mammogram should go for biopsy. Um, and we beat humans currently, because all of these had, had gone to biopsy. And our model, would predict, um, would save, I don't know the exact numbers because this keeps changing, but the fact is we can learn, which means that the labels we ascribe to the images are not random, which means that we're actually pulling out left breast, right breast, bilateral cancer, uh, or not. Um, so this is encouraging, and if we can do one and zero, breast cancer or not cancer, well, there's a whole pathology, there's a whole ontology of breast pathology that we can predict and extract from pathology notes. Right, so for now we've, you know, so, there's lymphoma, metastasis, breast cancer proper, and then all the benign stuff, all the stuff that is not cancer. A long tail of atypical findings on pathology, uh, fiber epithelial findings, and as you can see, a long tail of non-epithelial, uh, of non, uh, 
can serve breast pathology. Uh, so we're working on the next version of this, which is basically taking an image and predicting things like um, DCIS versus LCS, which no radiologist can do. Uh, we're working on that because we have such big data sets. Um, but the future is in three-dimensional breast radiology, right? So um, as I started off this talk, you know, we transitioned from an era of film into two-dimensional uh, mammography. So we're going through the, the, the transition from 2D into 3D mammography. Um, and here's what, instead of four, you know, a 2D mammogram is something like um, 10 megabytes, you know, four images. A 3D mammogram is something like 80 slices, 10 gigabytes. So you have a much higher resolution, arguably higher noise, arguably um, a more difficult task for a human to do. There's no difference between 2D and three-dimensional performance for radiologists. Um, and how do I know that? Because the FDA regulates every single mammogram that's run in America. So we know film took 15 years to extinguish. This is the two-dimensional um, wave, let's say, and we're in the three-dimensional wave. This is probably up to here by now because we're a year out. And these are the 9,000 facilities that the FDA regulates and what they report as the technology that they, they use for breast cancer screening, right? So, so which means we have about 10 to 15 years. It took BCSC 20 years to collect data to show us that cancer screening doesn't work. And that's based on film, right? We're, that data can't hardly be used for, uh, for prospective um, training because we don't do film anymore. We hardly do 2D anymore. We're moving to 3D. So my point is we have a very small period of time to collect this data, uh, process it, and learn from it if we expect to change these statistics. Like I said, 2D and 3D, no difference in sensitivity. It's probably harder for a first-year resident going and looking at you know, 10 gigabytes of data versus 10 megabytes. But here's a really uh, damning statistic, if you ask me. One in four cancer screener missed. One in four. Right? So why can a cancer be missed? It could be missed because it's just fast growing. It wasn't there when you screened at the beginning of the year. You know, every year, or every two years, depending on your stratification, you get screened. The cancer might just be fast growing. Okay, all the radiologists agree it wasn't there. It's there now. It, God forbid if you're this radiologist, but you could have made a mistake as a radiologist. So you missed this interval. Uh, but this is the, the, this is the cancer I showed you in the beginning. These are cult, radiographically occult breast cancers. You know, 7 to 30% or so of cancers are in this category. Um, and if you look at the screening population, it's a very tiny number. You need something like uh, 3,000 screeners to pick up one of these radiographically occult breast cancer. So with the data set we have now, in fact, with the whole BCSC for 20 years across six different states, they've screened, sorry, they've screened uh, over 2 million women, 95,000 cases of cancer. There's less than 300 interval cancers in that data set, and that's over 20 years, multi-site collection. Uh, so if we expect 1,000 examples of radiographically called breast cancer to, you know, like we have 1,000 dogs and cats that we can discriminate, we need a lot more data than UCSF ever has, at least ever had, if, even if they kept the film. So where does blockchain come into all of this? Uh, no one institution really has enough data to solve some of the problems that are very clear in breast and, I'm sure, other cancer radiology, right? Uh, so I came up with this idea, um, UCSF, Western Digital sponsors the hardware um, to get 5 million mammograms donated across institutions because no one institution has that amount of data. Um, and the way it's going to work is, you know, the way it works now, patients donate data to physicians. They, you know, they go to their physician, physicians put the data in the EHR, um, and scientists are supposed to get this data from the EHR. But it doesn't work like that, not in America at least. It's a capitalist health system, and big health systems, they hold on to their data. Um, in spite of the laws that exist, that actually mandate portability of the data. Um, you know, this high-tech act says everybody has to have electronic medical records. Uh, this HIPAA act is supposed to make the data portable, but there's also a privacy law that everybody hides behind. And I can understand. If I was um, a big healthcare institution, I would just not give out data and avoid being fined. Um, so what we built is on existing systems, right? So. All of these have systems. So the imaging that the doctor sits in in Germany and looks at imaging uh, for breast radiology is the same um, PAX system, the same communication protocol they sit in San Francisco and look on. So any, doc any PAX can beam an image to another PAX seamlessly. For the last 20 years, we've had that. 
So the images, that's the infrastructure is already there. HL7 is the new kid on the block. Well, not that new, but this adoption of HL7 for the other kinds of data, the pathology reports, the radiology reports, the labs, the drugs, so on and so forth, also exists today. So we put together this infrastructure to query PACs directly. You know, the law says if a patient wants me to see their report, nobody can stop that. That, that healthcare institution has to share it with me either as a doctor or as a scientist or anybody. The patient has the right to their data. It's their data. Uh, so we built this infrastructure, and now we very simply ask, we're, next month is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and we're in pink, right? Uh, and from next month, women can sign up and get this data delivered to their phones or to their website and pull it up on their phone, and for, you know, for the first time ever, I, arguably, <laughs> uh, they can see their imaging. But like I just said, if I want 5 million mammograms, each one is 10 gigabytes of, two to, of 3D data, that's a ton of storage. That's $250,000 a year to store that data in Amazon, that petabyte scale storage. I don't have $250,000 a year to store the data in Amazon, which is where this cryptocurrency, not cryptocurrency, I'm, I, I'm getting confused from the first talk, which is where blockchain and sort of the idea of cryptography comes in. Because today, uh, this IP, is, you know, so here's the cost, something like 200, quarter million dollars a year to store petabyte scale data in Amazon, right? Um, so IPFS allows us to distribute that cost. Right, so women can actually donate hard drive space to distribute um, redundancy of this data. This data can never be lost. It cannot be destroyed. It should not be destroyed. It's invaluable data. Um, so essentially, I can just have one Western Digital donated hardware and redundantly back it up over IPFS to anybody who wants to contribute. Women can actually own their data, see their data, touch their data, and eventually sell their data, which is where this is going. So just to close, I'm out of time. Um, Centralized data stores are insecure. I don't need to tell this group of computer scientists that, but when you see this show up on the Gray's Anatomy finale, like it's a big deal, right? So this is Europe, right? So I don't know if you know, but a couple of years ago, um, the National Health Services or system in England was hacked, um, asking for Bitcoin. This is a nefarious use of Bitcoin. We don't, in, we don't uh, um, definitely don't endorse it. But like, why did this happen? It happened because NHS has a centralized network, right? So there's one point of failure, it's attacked, uh, and it shut down the hospital. You know, patients missed surgeries and missed, you know, care was affected, people were affected. But who could predict sort of the geopolitical forces that led to this? If you look these three guys up on the internet, this is the one picture you're going to find. Because NSA developed the malware that WikiLeaks publicized and then North Korea weaponized to go shut down the NHS health system. Like, who could predict that? Like, that's crazy. So the security is one aspect that blockchain is supposed to solve. Um, but besides that, the way that the data works today, um, there is no mechanism to buy patient data. There's no mechanism to go get patient data. These deals are made behind closed doors, which means you're only going to get the data that a hospital is willing to sell you. Now, this is medicine, right? This is not physics, and it's not, <laughs> and it's not chemistry. Which means, why would I think that data from the West Coast, where there's a whole different set of uh, exposures and ethnicities and biology, is going to be comparable to data on the, on the East Coast? We've seen this before in genetics. 96% of genetic samples are Caucasian. And we don't want to see this in the age of AI, because Caucasians are not getting the most of the diseases. Um, so uh, let, just to close, and I set this up very nicely for the next talk on the details, um, we want to move to a more distributed system of storing this data that empowers not the healthcare systems to own it, but the patients that, you know, they pay, they have pain, and they have suffering. They should really own and benefit from this data. I think, I don't have this all figured out yet, but I think blockchain is the way to sort of to, to, to democratize and sort of um, build trust into this system. And I'm down to one slide here now. <laughs> uh, this is how it works now. Google goes around and buys up all the data. It goes by John's data, uh, Jack's data, and Joe's data. And there's no other way for Google to get it. Like, I'm not chastising Google. How else are they going to get the data? Um, they got caught in England. They paid a bunch of fines, because apparently it's illegal. And it's not just Google. A number of startups are having the same problem. This was last week, uh, Stone Kettering. People are upset. They're starting to realize what's going on. We've seen this before. Like, we've seen this with Napster, and LimeWire, and BitTorrent, and um, movies and media. Uh, but what I cannot be happy with is that this is people we're talking. Anybody knows who this is? This is Henrietta Lacks. No biologist in the crowd. You might have heard of HeLa cells. 70 pharmaceutical companies have been founded on this woman's genes. 
She had cervical cancer in the 50s. I think she died in the 50s. And some lab rat took her cells, immortalized them, and every biologist knows about HeLa cells. They're her cells, never compensated. Poor black woman from John Hopkins. It's the saddest story ever. Oprah made a movie about this. You should check it out. Um, anyhow, so blockchain is supposed to move us to federated types of machine learning where the data can stay private. The algorithm moves around. We don't just buy up the data and lose value for the patients, but this is the future. This is going on at Oxford, I believe. Andrew Trask is at Oxford. Um, and I will end there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dexter. Thanks. I'm so sorry, but I have to skip questions now because we are That's running fine. very late. But again, I promise we have time for questions later on. But I would like to welcome Mihai Alizino. He's founder of Akasha and co-founder of Ethereum and founder of Bitcoin Magazine, so he's very, very innovative. <laughs> Just come on. <laughs> um, Akasha is a new type of social network. That's his idea for the future of the Internet, and I think he will tell us much more about that in a few seconds. Welcome. So, hello and guten Tag, Heidelberg. I'm very excited to be here and uh, deeply honored. Um, this is, uh, in my opinion, truly one of those standing on the shoulders of giants uh, scenarios. And I hope to showcase some of the applications, the work of uh, some of the Heidelberg laureates in the field of mathematics and computer science have enabled. Um, and I'd just like to make clear from the beginning that this is not going to be a presentation about cryptocurrency. I think uh, Demelza Hayes from the University of Liechtenstein made a great job at covering that angle. Uh, this is uh, going to be more about the deeper implications and applications of this technology. And if you look at the bigger picture, we are now approaching the first decade since uh, blockchain technology, so to say, has entered our reality. And um, I think the laureates uh, in, in this audience or those that will watch online have contributed greatly. Uh, and today, it's almost as these applications and the stuff that we are able to build on top of their work is a ripple through time of some of the work that they have done decades ago, like, for example, elliptic curve cryptography. Um, so my goal today here is to share some of our, uh, like our story as Akasha, the, the foundation, uh, our research areas, which I hope will be interesting for some of you, and also invite you to collaborate. This is not uh, 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 by no means a, a charted territory, on the contrary. So this is going to be an odyssey of discovery for everyone. Like the, uh, on this note, I don't think there is such a thing as a blockchain expert yet because it's too early. Um, and that being said, uh, one of the things that made us want to start on this road is that we, have, uh, we find ourselves today in this uh, society, and uh, Dexter touched a bit about the implications, uh, or the deeper implications in our daily lives, where we have outsourced our privacy, our freedom of expression, and collective memory as a species to a handful of corporations, and I'm, I'm talking about planetary scale here. And this would be an overly simplified view of the interactions we have on a daily basis. You know, you post something on Facebook, you read an email, but at all times you are going through at least one entity. In most cases we are talking about tens or even hundreds of third parties that access and monetize in all kinds of ways your data. And to kind of, you know, showcase a dark side of this, like what happens when you exchange that data, when you post that message, when you add that reaction, uh, Facebook, and this is not very well known and surprised me, that actually has a pattern that can predict when you'll die. So this also kind of makes you wonder, like Google and all these big corporations, where, where this is going as an information society and what it means for, for our future and the children that will follow, that, you know, today are born with smartphones in their hands, so to say, and uh, how, how will their future look like, uh, especially when you add AI to the picture. And uh, that being said, Akasha uh, is a nonprofit born at the intersection of blockchain and collective intelligence, and I'll touch about the, on, on the collective intelligence a bit later. And uh, we seek to advance the design and application of technologies for sustainable systems at city, 
country and planetary scale. So uh, it's all about like localizing and uh, trying to find uh, the solution in the right context, but also have it, having it interoperable at a global scale. And we're doing this because we want to see a world where uh, human rights are defaults rather than features. Um, and I'm talking about things like uh, freedom of speech uh, and privacy, a world where people own their online lives and identities, so not like a service that grants you access to the service and which can be revoked at any time. And the world where your you know, human relations, so to say, your social graph is not owned by a corporation, which again, like your friends that you're talking with and you're exchanging uh, information, at any point if Facebook or whatever social network you're using that is centralized can determine if you are still able to contact your friends, which is not okay, right? Kind of makes you wonder what kind of world we'll leave to the next generation. And I hope with this work and the, the work that will continue to go on in this space, we will leave a better world, uh, you know, to be proud of. Like, yes, I've, I've, I remember Facebook, maybe 10 years from now. Um, and to give you a bit of a context, my story in this space began in 2011 uh, when I discovered Bitcoin. Uh, and it was one of those moments like, is this real? Uh, and when I was trying to understand uh, the, the technology and if this is a real innovation or, you know, scam, uh, I, I spotted the need for a coherent source of information, both for people that are trying to uh, learn about it and also for journalists that were trying to find someone to talk with, like, what is this thing? How does it, uh, how does it work? And a few weeks uh, later, after I, you know, made an impression, I, okay, this is real, uh, I got in touch with Vitalik Buterin, uh, and then that was kind of the early days of uh, Bitcoin magazine. And my story continues in 2012, uh, where I served uh, as editor-in-chief for the, the magazine. Um, and in this time, I think this was a, you know, an invaluable opportunity to immerse ourselves in this space and to see it from inside out, not from outside in. And that uh, gave us the opportunity to meet interesting people, share interesting ideas, and see many projects rise and fall in this period of time. Uh, it also kind of gave us an idea of what this technology can do, what it cannot do, where reality meets expectations. You know, it's not going to solve all our problems, but maybe it can help us solve some, at least. And this is how, in uh, 2013, the idea behind Ethereum started to take shape in Vitalik's mind. And I joined him in, in this project as a co-founder. Uh, and it's worth mentioning that Ethereum as a, as a concept uh, came in an era where most of the blockchains were single use case. So if you take Bitcoin as the first example of this, the use case of that blockchain is to be decentralized digital currency, right? And uh, in, in this case, uh, we proposed the idea of a general purpose blockchain that would, uh, how to say, liberate and empower developers to co-create on top of a shared infrastructure. This kind of points back to internet and how you have all these various devices from phones to laptops able to communicate with each other. In the same way, if you'd have a blockchain ecosystem where everything is fragmented, it will be harder to intercommunicate between them, right? So that's like the synergy kind of core value proposition of the project. In 2014, uh, I landed in uh, Switzerland together with a, a group of people where we set the base for uh, Ethereum Switzerland. It was a search in the early days. We tried to find the right jurisdiction for obvious reasons, still gray area in most. But uh, luckily the canton of Zug was open-minded enough and uh, it was very welcoming. And that uh, gave us a jurisdiction that we could call home, so to say. And fast forwarding a couple of months in, uh, and I, I suppose you know the slide uh, that the Melsa showed with the 2000 ICOs and coins. Like, we, I'm sorry, uh, we kind of started this. Uh, it wasn't called an ICO back in the day, but we were trying to find a way in which we can raise resources to pay developers and people that would help us to actually make the dream a reality, so to say. And this is how in 42 days, uh, Ethereum, and if you look at it, this is still an ongoing, so what's on number one, but Ethereum actually set a world record. 18 point, approximately 18.5 18 million uh, dollars raised through a peer-to-peer -peer currency, Bitcoin in this case, to build the next wave of a digital infrastructure. So it's almost like a cypherpunk inception movie where it's like the digital economy is building itself out. Uh, 
And uh, also to, to frame this, this was happening in a period of time where we had this vibrant community of people self-organizing uh, around the world, so this was not top-down uh, plan, and just sharing knowledge among each other. The social learning was a very important part of this. And 10,000 members in 2014. And now going to 2015, uh, in July 30, we had the Ethereum blockchain genesis, uh, which you know, moved Ethereum as a project from the dreamland to a platform where other people can build their dreams. And also like to make a connection with the first presentation, like if we look now, like fast forwarding three years, like this is the top 10 of the highest uh, crowdfunded uh, projects. And you see like from 18.5 millions, like the numbers jumped, like, for billions or, or hundreds of millions. But like what's interesting and what I'd like to attract your attention is that seven out of 10 are done on Ethereum. So it, this is one of the lowest hanging fruits of this technology, but it enabled people to raise funds for, for projects in a new way, bypassing the need to go through a centrally, you know, a VC or, or other uh, setup that uh, involves a third party. And in this case, like in the three years that uh, have passed, we have now surpassed one million people self-organizing around the world. So one million, 150,000 people around the world, like epic, right, 100x. And uh, going back to 2015, this was uh, when Ethereum was launched. I also told Vitalik and the rest that I was always excited about the, the things that can be built with this thing. So I never saw like the launch of the blockchain as a finish line, more like a starting uh, point. And this is when Akasha as an application, as a decentralized social network, started to take shape. And in uh, 2016, we uh, launched the alpha version, which uh, this is a preview of what it was able to do. Uh, basically, it, uh, what makes this application different from other applications is that it was running completely decentralized. So basically, if someone would install this application on their computer, in the background, they would install an Ethereum node and an IPFS node. And IPFS being the interplanetary file system, which acts as a complementary piece of the puzzle to store the information, and the blockchain being as more of an index. And as you see, since we are using blockchain for identities and people usernames, every identity is also a wallet. So this opens very intriguing ways for people to not exchange only status messages and posts, but also wealth in their social network. So this adds an, another dimension to social crowdfunding of sorts. And then going to 2017, we unveiled our beta, which is an iteration. We learned, like we looked at the alpha, okay, we can do better. But the purpose of the alpha was to prove that this idea can actually work, to have something that does not rely on servers. And the, the iteration was uh, going more towards uh, parallel experience. And in this particular video, we also explored the idea of having a multi-layered curation. Uh, so it's not like you have just a black and white approach, like you have the thumbs up, thumbs down, but you have actually a spectrum of opinions that build when you overlay some sort of emergent picture of our reality. And uh, in the meantime, you know, in this time, while we were focused on our own thing, the ecosystem around Ethereum and people building various things, and not only Ethereum, the blockchain ecosystem as a whole, has underwent a, like, like a sort of Cambrian explosion of things. And if we zoom in, hopefully let's see if this is visible, we have a bunch of, of, of projects in all sorts of areas, from uh, exchanges and trading, you know, financial services, GovTech, uh, wallets, and if we move down, uh, we have prediction markets, utilities, insurance and healthcare, uh, legal, so as you can see, many, many, many areas. And somewhere here on the right, uh, we also have, oh, let's see if this works. We have also Akasha as a social network on this area, right? But uh, while, we, while we saw this unfolding, so it was like a co-evolution of sorts, right? The, the platform on top of which we were, we were building was also evolving as we were moving forward. And we understood the need of shifting our understanding of what we are doing, taking again a couple of steps back and looking at what we actually want to achieve. And this made us understand that we need to move beyond like thinking of the application as a social networking app and rather putting it into a, an ecosystem view because this was already kind of a network of sorts. But what was lacking was this interconnective tissue that will leverage the synergy of this ecosystem. So now, even if these applications and all these projects could talk to each other, they're not very good at doing that. 
So in this concept, the Akasha kind of starts to begin morphing into like this uh, emergent uh, framework rather than something overlaid on top. And uh, moving on, something that, uh, you know, to summarizes uh, to some extent the shift from the current paradigm to the next one is this re-decentralization. So the early ideas of the internet and so on all revolved around having no central point of failure. But the hyper-centralization we saw manifesting, you know, Facebook, billions of people, Google, billions of people in half a planet, uh, have led to this like uh, super, I don't know how to call it, uh, like an information dead star of sorts, right? That is not necessarily contributing back to society. And if you have that pyramid of data, information, knowledge, wisdom, like our society as a whole, even if it's an information-based society, has very little knowledge and arguably v less wisdom, right? Because all that data that we are producing, all that information that we are producing, is now siloed, captured, and monetized, analyzed by these corporations. And the, the knowledge or wisdom that is derived from that is not necessarily to, to the betterment of humanity, rather the betterment of the algorithm serving ads. And uh, in this paradigm, you see the user, uh, in the decentralized paradigm, the user as being in the control of their flows. And this uh, it involves the social networks, which can be, you know, a social network at work, a social network at home, a social network with your friends, and then you have your own things in the house. Uh, in this context, the Internet of Things. And the user, through this identity and security layer, which could be framed as a blockchain infrastructure, but, you know, it's not like the user has to understand blockchain in order to use it, it's just like you don't need to understand electricity in order to turn on the light. You just press something, a button, turn on, turn off. And then this feedback, again, can happen locally on the user's device. So it's, there's no need for that huge data center somewhere to collect that. We've moved past that stage. We all basically have supercomputers in our pockets. And um, to kind of give you an idea of where we're going and if there might be some overlap between our interests, uh, our research centers around three main pillars, like what, who, and how. So when I say who, it refers to who are you. Who are you? Are you uh, delimited by your physicality, as in I am this trillion of cells just standing here and giving this talk? Am I uh, a, a trait, or is it my identity is limited to the passport my government gives me? Uh, same with the username that you have on a social network, same with the cryptographic identity, which can be represented by a key pair. But, you know, you have hundreds of projects that operate in this field. There are hundreds of initiatives that uh, kind of search to break down and this challenge from this perspective. But something to note here, that this is a binary universe, where you either have it or you don't. You're either in or you're out, right? But that's not really how the world works uh, in reality. Uh, we are more like this fluid, multidimensional uh, beings. It's not like you can be summed up to just one trait or to one passport or to one driving license, right? Or to one username. It's more like we have these separate and sometimes, sometimes only, overlapping circles of friends, reputation, and knowledge that we can build on top of. And this is the area where we focus. And this is an area that's not too, how to say, too popular. Hopefully this will change in the future. It's also uh, more complex to solve. But, you know, what's the point of uh, uh, researching something if it's not uh, challenging? And um, when we touch on the what, you know, and uh, as you can see, the presentation it does not focus very much on the technology, but rather the implications and where humans and technology kind of come together. And uh, in this case, uh, how many of you are familiar with uh, DAOs? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, well, <laughs> not bad. Uh, I've seen a few hands. So basically, a decentralized autonomous or a distributed autonomous organization is a f new form of organizing for people, right? So if we look back a couple of hundred uh, years ago, we had the corporation as a way or, or a legal structure around which people, individuals, could come together towards some shared goal. Right? So in that case, it could be I know, a mining company which has the goal of you know, extracting coal from the mine, a petrol, and so on. But in this case, you, know, you also have the system, which as a whole, if you look at the constitution, the laws, and all this stuff can be seen as a sort of protocol uh, at societal level in this jurisdiction. So this is the accepted social stuff, this is what's not accepted, and we operate within that. So it's like the green light, we can go, the red light, no, you stop. 
So in the same way, you can define these kind of rules that help us organize and coordinate e with each other. And just that instead of using, you know, uh, papers and uh, complicated laws and, and so on, you have this ability of creating an organization where you define these laws in a transparent manner using smart contracts. By the way, how many of you are familiar with smart contracts? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, that's better. So the smart contracts are like the building block on top of Ethereum, which can be uh, anything mathematically uh, defined as a set of conditions. So it's like an if this, then that kind of scenario. Uh, but the, the main uh, purpose here is that these organizational forms that we come up with as a society a couple of hundred years ago, were all relying on one central point, a president, a CEO, you know, a general manager. But in this scenario where everyone has uh, connectivity, everyone has an access to, to, you know, to being connected with the whole group, it's not so much a problem of coordination and getting people together, which was a problem a couple of hundred years ago, but not so much today. So the stakeholders, the participants in this group can all signal, like, where do you want to go? Similar to how you have the flamingo birds, you know, like signaling, signaling with their heads, and depending on where they most point, that's where they go. So in a similar fashion, which might seem like chaotic, you can have some sort of order emerge. And uh, that's the decentrally organized part. And now, uh, coming back to you know, the setup of this uh, event, uh, this might seem familiar to some. Uh, this is a schematic from the, the mathematical theory of communication, uh, also known as the Shannon Weaver uh, model, uh, which uh, treats the, how to say, the communication, right? A theory of communication and uh, this it's fantastic this is like one of the building blocks that enabled us to build many things from like building satellites understanding black holes and you know most of the internet and applications we use today are still built on top of this and this works great uh, because uh, computers message so when you have messages and signals that travel to this framework this applies very well however when you add people, like humans, into the picture, it's almost like we're missing a piece of the puzzle. And this is a, um, where conversation theory comes into play. And again, I'd like to point out that this is like decades old uh, research uh, that was done by Gordon Pask, and uh, nowadays is continued by Paul Pangaro through his work. And in this scenario, you have a, a setup where the participants that use the signaling uh, the messaging uh, framework, can coordinate and come together uh, to achieve a common goal. And this is formalized. This is like one of the, the applications of cybernetics in the context of how humans and machines can uh, you know, uh, uh, leverage their overlaps to increase their potential. And in, uh, in this context, like putting back the blockchain, you know, this is decades old, this is all fun and so on, but if you put back in the blockchain context, now you have this uh, idea of a conversational DAO. So on one side you have the transactions and people being able to signal, but you don't necessarily have the interface that would enable these participants to easily and efficiently come together and uh, to, towards a, a common goal. And this is quite exciting. Uh, and this is a, a quote from Paul Pangaro that says, well, creation has shifted from prior knowledge, so like patents, IP, and, you know, the classic, to the ability to gain new knowledge in action. Because also the world around us is, like, constantly shifting and accelerating in this change, right? It's a lot more fast than it was a couple of hundred years ago when we had this form of organization that might have been, you know, okay. But these days, I think we are reaching the limits of what this form of organization can do at the planetary and you know, country or local uh, scale. And also something to, to note, that this is taken from economy of insights, conversations as transactions. You know? So again, putting into the context of, of blockchain. And to kind of wrap this up and touch also on the, what... Uh, Dexter was talking about when it comes to data, as in uh, uh, something that can be applied also on the medical side. Um, there is a, a question here. Is it something you own? Some people might say that. But if you look at it as something you own, you get to like some weird ethical uh, debates, as in, you know, you either own this jacket or you don't. I have it or you do, but not the both of us. 
And I think in the, in the next iteration of what this web kind of uh, infrastructure opens, we have to go beyond that. And we, got, we have to go towards an era where our understanding of what the data is is not something we own, but something we actually are. Because from those patterns, going back to what Facebook and, you know, like predicting when you can die, that's actually us. It's almost like a doppelganger of ourselves in a digital form. And uh, this is why, again, privacy and encryption and this platform should, you know, excite people because it can empower them and, again, retake control over this whole infrastructure that was developed around us while we were sleeping or scrolling through the feed. And... Uh, uh, to, to wrap it up, how we can do that, uh, self-sovereign technologies uh, are defined as something, but you know, there are many, uh, many definitions, but one of them is that they serve you and no one else. And uh, in the context where we, we, we explored how these entities are in the middle and exploiting basically this uh, human desire of connecting with another because we are social humans, uh, social animals, and then you have like the social network as the killer application of the internet. No surprise there, right? Uh, we also can create this infrastructure where that desire of each other connecting with another is done on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, like it was done hundreds of years ago, like it was done thousands of years ago before we had this infrastructure developed that just captured and monetized our relations and our interactions with each other. So, uh, to put it in, in, a, in a nutshell, the collaboration with Paul Pangaro for us was, a, was an example how transdisciplinarity can help us and how sometimes old research, uh, you know, in the decades old research can be applied in the new context. And in a, in a, you know, in a world where things can be, everything is a remix and sometimes old ideas in a new context can come up with new solutions, we think it's, it's the same now. And uh, I think we live in an age where the gap uh, between when math is being invented and when it is being used, it's collapsed. So you see, we have this decades-old lag in, in research, like, for example, elliptic curve cryptography, which is at the heart of many blockchain projects. And uh, it's almost like we see this ripple through time, right? There was these smart guys coming, putting down equations, and now decades later, there are these cypherpunks, you know, just stumbling upon something, yes. That, that can work, and then you just combine it in a way to, to make a meaningful application. And um, I think new and old mathematics and computer science can truly make a difference in years rather than decades if we come together and we explore the, the, the interest, the shared interest and shared goals we have as you know, a group of uh, a community just uh, appreciating the intellectual challenge and the curiosity in finding new solutions to sometimes old problems. And um, the, the idea here is that we invite everyone that is interested in exploring this or has some inclination towards blockchain as a, you know, a, a tangible application in our real world to get in touch and basically to turn that beautiful mathematics into meaningful application that can truly make a difference for people around the world. Thank you.